Hello, Life Point friends and family. Thank you for joining us today. If you're new, welcome to the family. May God's message find its way to you no matter where you are. Enjoy the service.
been thinking about time And where does it go? How can I stop my life from passing me by? I don't know I've been thinking about family How it's going so fast But I wake up one morning just wishing that I could go back I've been thinking about lately, maybe I can make a change and let you change me So with all of my heart, this is my prayer Just wanna stay where you are All I got is one shot, one try One go around in this beautiful life Nothing is wasted when everything's placed in your hands Sing on you until that day you call me home sing it oh lord keep me in the moment help me live with my eyes wide open cause i don't want to miss what you have for me i don't want to miss i don't want to miss
matter what Thank you, God. We praise you this morning. And we thank you so much for who you are. And thanks for always being someone that we can go to at any time, any hour, every second of the day. Even when man continuously lets us down, we know that you're always there and that you love us. And no matter what we've done, you're such a forgiving father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, LifePoint friends and family. We're so happy that you're here with us today. And if this is your first time joining us, we would love to connect with you. So if you could please text hello to the number on the screen below. You can also text your prayer request to that same number or use the prayer request button in the chat area online. Enjoy the service, and we hope that God reaches your heart today with our message. God bless. question, do you love your family? Well, of course you do. You, as soon as I say that, you, there's not any hesitation. There's no question. Of course you love your family. Well, what happens when they do something that's wrong? When your kids do something that they shouldn't do or some other family member, do you still love them? Well, yes. Well, how do you feel about it when it becomes really obvious they're going to keep doing it? Would it be something that you'd want to, well, would you, would you want to step in and would you want to, in some fashion or another, try to stop them? Would you want to punish them if they just kept doing things that were leading them in the wrong direction? I mean, if you're a good parent, would you simply ignore the wrong that your kids are doing? Or would you try to do something? And would it be an evidence that you actually love that child? I think so. So I think... If I were to ask you the question, do you want justice, I think you would say, yes, I, I, I like justice. Wait a minute, now, that's a, wait a minute. did we just jump from disciplining my child to justice? Well, yes, but would there need to be justice in your own family? Uh, yeah. Would you want to have justice administered to someone that hurt one of your children? What if they repeatedly hurt your children? How would you begin to feel then? At that point, your emotions start kicking in. I mean, if you're a mother, you know, I'm hoping you don't have a gun in your hand because you'd be dangerous at that point, wouldn't you, if someone were hurting your child over and over again? It's a natural response to the fact that you love, that you care. If someone can hurt your children and you not care, or if your children can mess up and you don't care, that's actually not a very good sign, is it? So the question becomes, do you want God to be just? Be careful. 
I'm setting you up. You ready for the setup? Here it comes. Do you want God to be slow to administer justice, or do you want him to be swift to administer justice? How about do you want God to administer justice immediately? I don't know about you, but I don't want immediate justice. If I had gotten immediate justice, I wouldn't be standing here right now. Because of some of the stunts I pulled in my lifetime, if God were to administer immediate justice to me, well, I wouldn't be here. Does it bother you when you see people suffering or when you see evil? Does it bother you? Does it bother you when you see suffering and evil and it doesn't stop? And you're thinking, okay, where's God in this deal? I mean, why doesn't God stop it? And so you have a tendency to get upset because, where's the, I mean, I want to stop all this suffering and evil. And then, I'm telling you, I'm setting you up. Be careful. How do you feel when God does administer justice? When you read in the Bible about a point in which God administered justice to a person, don't, do you recall? I, I do. It probably, justice is such a hard thing to deal with. Here's what I think. I think that we, we, have, we have a hard time both ways. We have a hard time when we, don't, we see evil and suffering in it and the hammer doesn't come down to stop it. And we have trouble when we see justice being administered we actually struggle both ways. One of the common things that I, I find that people struggle with in, in terms of how they feel about God and what we see in the Bible is that very issue. They'll think, well, wait, why doesn't, I, I mean, I'll have the same person tell me, well, I don't know why we so much suffering and evil in the world. And they're like, they're upset with God because there is. And then when they read about points at which God does administer justice, they're upset because he does. And if we're not careful, we'll have the same reaction. I mean, here's what I, I don't know about you, but if I'm not careful, I'm going to think, you know what I'd like? I'd like to have mercy for me and justice for you or somebody else that's not close to me. We can be that way about things. And so when we look in the Bible, sometimes... This is a really important thing I'm talking to you about. There are people in your family right now that are struggling. There are people in your family that are not watching online or not in person today because they struggle with this very issue. They're, they're kind of upset because God doesn't stop all the suffering and evil they see, and they're also upset because they read about times when he did. There are five books in the Bible... Now, we call them books. There's 66 books in the Bible. Everything that's a separate division is called a book, whether it be long or short. There's one called Obadiah. It's really short. It's only one chapter long. It's the only one-chapter book in the Old Testament. Now, there are four one-chapter books in the New Testament, but there's only one in the Old Testament. And it's very short. And for you to understand it, that you have to understand what I've already introduced to you. What's the background for this thing called Obadiah? My guess is, if I ask for a show of hands, are people to respond in the chat online? Have you read Obadiah in the last little bit? The answer is going to be no. Now, the key to understanding something like the book of Obadiah is to understand the time that it was written in because it was written by a prophet for a reason. And to have the understanding of the background is really essential. If you, wanna, if you really want to understand it, you have to know the context that the thing took place in. What happened? What set it up? Why did he act that way? Let's find out. You've heard about the Jewish people, no doubt, right? 
And so you know the Jewish people started with one person. What God did is he went to a man by the name of Abram, and he said, Abram, here's what I want you to do. You've been successful. He was a wealthy guy. I want you to leave everything that you've got. I want you to leave your family, your country, and everything. And I want you to go to a place, to a land that I'm going to eventually give to you. And I'm going to bless you. And this is what we find out in the book of Genesis to help us understand the background for Obadiah. In Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, it says, Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. He didn't even know where he was going. He basically said, just keep going. I'll tell you when you get there. I will make you into a great nation. Now, that's interesting. He had no kids. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. His descendants, the Jewish people, that carries forward. That's the reason people, so many Christians today are supportive of the, the Jewish people because of verses like this. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. How in the world could every family on earth be blessed through this? Well, it's because the Messiah was eventually going to come through a, a descendant, which was Mary. Then he went on to say this. Then the Lord said to him this. You can be sure of what I'm about to tell you. For 400 years, this is a verse that almost nobody fully gets. They, you kind of read over it and you skip over it, and you don't understand the full implications of it. But I hope by the time we finish today that you understand that that verse right there explains a great deal. If, it might be one of these verses that you need to actually write. If you have a physical Bible, I hope you do, that you might actually want to write Genesis 15, 13 in there. And you'll say, why? Well, I think you'll find out in a few minutes. For 400 years, your family who comes after you will be strangers in another country. That turns out that was Egypt. They will become slaves there and will be treated badly. But I will punish the nation that makes them slaves. And after that, they will leave for many possessions. In fact, when they left, they just dumped gold and silver and all kinds of stuff on them before they left. But you will die in peace. You will join the members of your family who have already died, and you will be buried when you're very old. Then it goes on to say this. Your children's grandchildren will come back here. That's because the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached the point where I must punish them. Say what? He's saying that I'm going to, that these people are messing up, but it's going to be 400 years before I bring justice to them because I'm going to be that merciful and patient with them. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael is the father of all Arabic people. Isaac's the father of all Jewish people. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau became the father, the starter of a nation called Edom, which doesn't exist anymore. Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons are the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those 12 sons was Joseph. Joseph was a very famous person. He was the, he was the youngest, not, well, almost the youngest, and the, but the brothers got really hacked off about Joseph. They, they got so angry with him that they sold him as a slave, on, and he ended up in Egypt, and through a series of miraculous events, he became the second most powerful person in Egypt. Only the Pharaoh was more powerful. And because of that, when a great famine happened, God, it's a really fascinating story. If you've never read the story of Joseph in Genesis, you should read it. All, those, all his brothers and his family were brought to Egypt, and they lived there, and Joseph forgave them, and they survived the great famine. But after Joseph died, the next Pharaoh made slaves of all his family and their descendants. And they stayed slaves for 400 years until what happened? Until Moses came along and said, God sent them, said, deliver the, my people, from slavery. And so Moses led the people out of Egypt to the, back to the land that they were promised for 400 years. When they got to that land, the leadership was handed over to a man by the name of Joshua, and Joshua led them into the land, and they conquered the land. 
They took it from the people that were there. And that was God's punishment for the people. We'll find out why. After that, they were led temporarily by people called judges. When they had a problem, a leader would arise and deal with the problem for the whole, all 12 tribes. After the period of that, they decided they wanted a king, so they started having kings. And the first king was Saul. The second king was King David. That's the same David that fought Goliath, the same David that became one of the greatest kings of all time, the greatest leaders of all time, that, that brought Israel to a place of prominence. And then he had a son by the name of Solomon. And Solomon, according to the Bible, was the wisest man who ever lived. Under them was the golden age of Israel, of the Israelites. When Solomon died, he had a son by the name of Rehoboam. Unusual name. Made some bad decisions. When he was about to be inaugurated as king, the people came to him and said, hey, your father did a great job, but he really kind of made it tough on us. He, he taxed us and he drafted us or conscripted us into service. And we're just asking, can you kind of dial it back a little bit for a while so we can have a time to kind of recharge? And, and he asked, uh, you know, what should I do? His advisors, the older advisors, his older mentors said, give them people what they ask for and they'll follow you. It's going to be good. It'll work out great. His young friends he was young. He had young friends, and they're all hot-headed. And they said, "Nah, you tell them who's boss." And so he walked back and basically ignored the, the the wisdom of the older people and said, "Hey, you think my dad was tough? I'm going to tax you even more, and I'm going to work you even harder." Well, civil war broke out. The ten northern tribes split off and started fighting the two southern tribes, and they formed two different groups of people. At that time, the, the ten northern tribes were called Israel. The two southern tribes were called Judah, and Judah was around Jerusalem, at the bottom of the map when you look at the map. This began a time of spiritual decline big time on both groups. They both walked away from God and basically drifted away and got to the point where they were just doing, well, they just really weren't doing anything right. When you read about it, you, what you'll see is this began the era of the prophets. When you re look in the Old Testament, you see all these prophets, like Jeremiah, Isaiah, I mean, the the list is long. Why did they show up? And what were they doing? Well, these prophets were there trying to call the people back to a right relationship with God and have them to react properly toward each other and, well, just to follow God's desire for their life. They refused. So a 350-year decline began. Eventually, in 722... A group called the Assyrians came in and conquered the ten northern tribes. It came to the point where God had said, look, I just, I'm not going to protect you any longer. The Assyrians came in and conquered the ten northern tribes. They were scattered and there were no more. If you ever heard the expression, the ten lost tribes of Israel, that's where it came from. The southern tribes off and on, mostly off in terms of following God. They continued to decline. Prophets continued to go to them, trying to get them to do the right thing. They didn't learn a lesson from them, just looking at what happened to the ten northern tribes because they kept messing up themselves. They kept drifting away. Hey, we have a tendency to drift a little too, don't we? Prophet after prophet kept coming to them until finally in 586, the new big dog on the street was not the Assyrians, but it was the Babylonians. So the Babylonians came in and conquered the two southern tribes that were called Judah at that time. And they were taken away into captivity. Those of you that are familiar with the Bible, this is where Daniel goes back to, to, to uh, work, you know, serve under Nebuchadnezzar and all that kind of stuff. Famous story. That's the time period that Obadiah was sent as a prophet after the two southern tribes were carried away into captivity. It wasn't until the Persians came along and conquered the Babylonians and let, the, I let a remnant, a small number of the Jewish people return back to Jerusalem that it was reestablished and rebuilt. And then you don't hear anything much more about what took place in those next 400 years until Jesus shows up and then that's what we call the New Testament. So when Ob Obadiah was serving, when he was prophesying, here's the, 
the, the scene is set, right? In the sense that the 12 tribes are split. The 10 northern tribes have already been conquered, dispersed around the world. The two southern tribes have now been conquered by the Babylonians. And the Israelite people are still, even in the middle of all of this, still not all turning back to God. And Obadiah is sent to help these people come to their senses and to turn back to God. And he also begins to explain what's about to happen. So what is a prophet exactly? When we talk about a prophet, most of the time you have a tendency to think, well, they, they're telling the future. Well, there was a little bit of that, but most of what a prophet actually did was speak to the current circumstances of the people at that point. What they would do is they would tell the people, hey, what you're doing right now is wrong. You're heading in the wrong direction. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting your nation. You're hurting your family. You're making a mess of this thing. Turn back to God. God's ways are better. That was their main thing, was moral in the sense of helping people turn back to God. But they also had some immediate predictions about things that were going to happen in the immediate future. Like, for example, what we're going to talk about today. But they also occasionally would have things that are going to happen in the distant future. And some, and some of them even at the very end of the age when Jesus is going to come back. And the mysterious things are going to take place then. And the promises associated with the, what was referred to as the end times. So Obadiah, you can read it in four minutes. It's 21 verses. Here's what we know about Obadiah. He wrote that book. That's it. We don't know where he's born. We don't know his father. We don't know anything about it. It was actually a very common name. And so when you read in the Bible, you'll see lots of Obadiahs, and it's not always plain, well, is it the same one that we're talking about here? It's, and sometimes it's really obvious it wasn't because it's a different time period. Obadiah was actually a common name. But what is plain is what he had to say about what was going to happen to a place called Edom. Remember that Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac had a son, Jacob, and Esau. Esau formed the nation of Edom. And here's the vision. That the way that God communicated with Obadiah was through a vision. And what he communicated was that a very simple thing. He said, Edom, you're about to be destroyed. Israel... As bad as it looks right now, the day is going to come when you'll be, re you'll be restored. And salvation is going to come to the earth. You're referring to Jesus. Here's what we read beginning in our first verse. This is the vision that the sovereign Lord revealed to Obadiah concerning the land of Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord that an ambassador was sent to the nations. To say, get ready, everyone, let's assemble our armies and attack Edom. The Lord says to Edom, I will cut you down to size among the nations. You will be greatly despised. You've been deceived by your own pride because you live in a rock fortress and make your home high in the mountains. Who can ever reach us way up here, you ask boastfully. But even if you soar as high as the eagles and build your nest among the stars, I will bring you crashing down, says the Lord. All your allies will turn against you. They will help to chase you from the land. They will promise you peace while plotting to deceive and destroy you. Your trusted friends will set traps for you, and you won't even know about it. They didn't realize what was about to happen. God's revealing this to the people of Israel. God had reached a point where he was going to act. What's not obvious to you is that Edom had been an enemy, had been often owned to the Israelites, their relatives, for over a thousand years. When we hear stuff like this, it bothers us because Here's what I like. I like the part where it talks about how God loves us and he's patient with us and he's merciful and he wants to forgive us. 
and he wants us to have a new beginning. And he, he's just at, he's at work in our life. And, he, and he, he, he loves us so much that he came as the man Jesus to, to teach us the way, to show us what he's like, to provide forgiveness for us. I like that. I recall a little bit. I'm going, oh, wow, that's heavy. When we, the, the whole thing about, well, this wrath of God stuff, hard to deal with, isn't it? But God is also a just God. The thing about it is, and remember I pointed out the 400 years? The 400 years is significant, not in relation to Edom, but in relation to the Canaanites, the people that lived in that promised land, who were given an initial 400 years to turn from what they were doing. You see, as much as you've heard about maybe God driving a hammer, so to speak, that's a last resort. He doesn't want to do that. He's patient to a fault, if if anything. He offers grace and forgiveness to us. He doesn't want for that to be the end result. What he wants is for us to realize that he loves us and he wants to help us come to live in a right relationship with him and with others. But he's also a just God. What I find is this. Sometimes I wonder, why does God put up with me? But I, time after time, I go to God and, and day, well, hey, it's every day. And I confess my fears, anxieties, impatience, what, whatever it might be. And I find a God who, who is at work in my life. I don't know about you. Maybe at this very moment, you're sensing that, yeah, you know, I, I, oh, I, I'm, I'm becoming aware of my, where I've sinned. Well, you see, when God points that out, the Bible calls that conviction of sin. When he does that, it's to love you back into a right relationship with him. He does us the favor of, of saying, hey, when you talk to your family member that way, it wasn't good. It was wrong. Go to him and apologize. You see, what he wants us to do is have a right relationship with him and each other. He's not wanting to do the opposite. There are reasons that God did what he did toward Edom. And Obadiah goes on to talk about it. He says, because of the violence you did to your close relative. Remember, Esau had a brother whose name was Jacob. And their descendants were fighting each other. It had been going on forever. Because of the violence you did to your close relatives in Israel, you will be filled with shame and destroyed forever. When they were invaded, you stood aloof, refusing to help them. Foreign invaders carried off their wealth and cast lots to divide up Jerusalem. But you acted like one of Israel's enemies. You should not have gloated when they exiled your relatives to distant lands. You should not have rejoiced when the people of Judah suffered such misfortune. You should not have spoken arrogantly in that terrible time of trouble. You should not have plundered the land of Israel when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have gloated over their destruction when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have seized the wealth when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have stood by at the crosswalls killing those who tried to escape. When you should not have captured the survivors. And what did they do when they captured them? Well, they handed them over to the enemy and they got killed. You see, they weren't just, God wasn't just upset with them because of what they did that was wrong, but sometimes because of the things they didn't do. Sins of omission, sins of commission. There are some things that we failed to do that are a problem. It isn't just what we did, sometimes it's what we didn't do. And he finishes by saying this. The day is near when I, the Lord, will judge all godless nations. As you have done to Israel, so it will be done to you. All your evil deeds will fall back on your own heads. Just as you swallowed up my people on my holy mountain, Jerusalem, so you and the surrounding nations will swallow the punishment I pour out on you. Yes, all you nations will drink and stagger and disappear from history, which is exactly what happened. But Jerusalem will become a refuge for those who escape. 
It will be a holy place. And the people of Israel will come back to reclaim their inheritance. And then listen to this final statement. There will be no survivors in Edom. I, the Lord, have spoken. And then he says the exiles of Israel will return to their land. Those who have been rescued will go up to Mount Zion in Jerusalem to rule over the mountains of Edom. And the Lord himself will be king. Hard, hard stuff. What happened to Edom in 554, in 553, they were conquered. They were eliminated. It came to pass, just as Obadiah said. What God wants to do is he wants to extend mercy and grace to us. He doesn't want to do anything of this nature. That is not what he wants. A God who would go to as much trouble as he did to come as the man Jesus to t- teach us about himself, to reveal what God's like. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus in the New Testament. There were moments at which he got impatient and, so to speak, dropped a hammer too. Did you pay attention? But it was so obvious that he came to pay. He, came, he loved us so much that he came to say this, I am going to do the just thing. I am going to pay the penalty for your sin. I am going to suffer for what you've done is wrong. And what you have to do, to become, here's what you have to do to become a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. You have to admit that I've done wrong and you're sorry about it. And you say, Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me because you can, because you paid the penalty for my sin on the cross. And so a Christian is a person who admit, admits, I've sinned, I'm sorry, and trusts Jesus to forgive them and gives Jesus leadership of their life. That's what Jesus did. A God that would come and do that for us? Wow. That answers a lot of my questions. But he also said this at one time. He said, and the, and the Lord himself will be king. When was that going to happen? That hadn't happened just yet. You see, there, every once in a while, they're, they're throwing this little simple allusion to what's going to happen one day. And what's referred to as the end times. Ultimately, if you read the book of Revelation, it's the last book in the Bible. It's a confusing book. But one thing is really obvious. We know who wins in the end, and we know what he does. We just don't fully understand all the details associated with it because God deliberately veiled the details. But here's what he'd have us to do. How does it apply to us? Well, it applies to us in this way. When you're talking to maybe you, Maybe you're here today and you're struggling. Oh, God, this is so hard. Why don't you do something about the suffering and evil? I mean, drop the hammer, God. And then you stop and think, wait a minute now. Do I really, is that really what I want? Yeah, I, what I want, I, well, no, yes. Uh, well, I don't want the suffering and evil. I don't want the dropping the hammer. I mean, ah. Uh. And then you think when you drop the, you know, when you, he does drop the hammer, then you well, I, I'm kind of upset because you did. I mean, I wanted you to do something, but, I, well, we, you see where we kind of end up? It gets, it gets hard, doesn't it? God doesn't want to do that. What God he went to a lot of trouble to do was to provide forgiveness and new beginnings for us. Ah, <laughs> All right. his patience, his love, it's, it's, it's staggering. But it's also staggering to say no to God. Because the consequences ultimately are staggering. Obadiah, 21 verses. A prophet sent to tell the people eventually you'll come back. Eventually. A remnant will come back and restore Jerusalem. And the nations that have been against you are about to experience what it's like when they run out of grace and mercy. Hard stuff, isn't it? It really is hard stuff. But let's bring it down to you. God would tell us 
to seek justice and love mercy. God loves you. And God's doing you the favor of pointing out when you've done wrong. If you've never trusted Jesus for forgiveness and given him leadership in your life, if you begin to feel some guilt over your sin, you're saying, I, I realize I've sinned. I don't understand all this. I'm not even happy about all of this. I don't even know what to think about all this. But if you're feeling those kinds of things, that's God's spirit working on you to help you realize that the thing that you've done that's wrong is he's trying to bring you into a right relationship with him. And then he wants to bring you into a right relationship with other people in your life. And so what he wants you to do is to realize that Jesus really is who he said he was. And for you to ask Jesus, to trust Jesus, to forgive you and to be the leader of your life. The biblical language of that is trust him as your Savior and Lord. And then as you go through your daily life as a Christian, you're still, well, you still mess up. And so when you mess up, you fess up you f to God and to anybody you wronged. And that's the way God would have you to live your life. And for those of you that are here today and you need a new beginning, which is every person that's online and in person, join me in what I do every day, which is begin again. I go to God afresh. I welcome his conviction because I want to be right with him and others. And I think you do too. So I'd encourage you, if you've never trusted Jesus, here's what I want you to do. I want you to say, Jesus, I'm, I'm asking you to forgive me for everything I've ever done in the past. Every sin I'll do today and every sin I'll ever do in the future. I'm trusting you to forgive me for my sin, to save me from the penalty of my sin. And Jesus, I know you can do a better job of leading my life than I can, so I'm asking you to do that. I want you to be the leader. Help me learn how to follow you. That's what God wants for you, a new beginning at this moment. Father, I just pray that you do a wonderful work in our lives. I pray that you'd help us all to, to realize that you love us so much you came for us. As your word says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I pray that you'd help every person here who's never crossed the line of faith to today to just turn to you and say, God, I don't get it all, but I get this much. I've sinned and I'm sorry. I don't understand it all, but I believe that Jesus really did die for my sins. He was buried and resurrected to prove it's all true. And so, Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me, to be my Savior, to be my leader. And for every Christian here, Father, I pray that you'd help them to have a new beginning today, that they'd deal with their sin, and any person that they wronged, they'd go to them and say, I was wrong. Help us today to have a new beginning. Help us today to seek justice, but to love mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house 